The sense that you were participating in life was only ever an illusion. Life is just something we watch unfold. This show gets off to a pretty weird and creepy start with some ominous choir music and a montage with views of San Francisco intercut with mysterious monoliths, people appearing to have violent mental breakdowns, repeated images of a little girl, and a man standing in a forest in the dark. Sergey and Lily live together and work at the same groundbreaking tech company called Amaya. They wake up, share breakfast, and take the Amaya shuttle to the company's impressive campus, which is set in an idyllic forest and overlooked by a gigantic and creepy doll-like statue of that same little girl. Amaya seems to be like the Microsoft of San Francisco. Sergey works in the AI department and has an important demonstration that day to the CEO himself, Forrest. He comes late to the meeting, excusing his tardiness by explaining that one of their competitors planted a story in the New York Times suggesting that Amaya needs government oversight. Sergey has coded an algorithm that can predict the movements of the nematode. Although the algorithm breaks down after 30 seconds, it's still highly impressive and earns Sergey an invitation to join the coveted and mysterious devs department. But first, he has to pass an interview with Amaya's thorough and xenophobic head of security, Kenton. He's apparently nervous that Sergey is Russian and his girlfriend, Lily, is third-generation Chinese. Still, he passes the security check and enters the devs program. Forrest shows him around personally, bringing him to a building set back from the campus and through the woods. The labs and the machine inside are protected by a lead Faraday shield about 13-yard thick concrete shell around a gold mesh with an 8-yard unbroken vacuum seal. Sergey wonders how they can get through the unbroken vacuum seal, but you'll see, says Forrest. It's pretty neat. Everything inside devs is pretty neat. They get through the vacuum by taking a floating horizontal elevator supported by an electromagnetic field. The machine is massive taking up nearly all the internal space of the building. When Sergey asks how many qubits the machine is running, Forrest answers that it's a number that seems pointless to express as a number. So, whatever this project is, it is vast and elaborate. Forrest shows Sergey to his workstation. He's not told his purpose. His job is just to read code and figure it out. And it doesn't take Sergey long to figure it out. Whatever he reads in the code, it's something devastating. He has a small breakdown in the bathroom and even throws up. Before returning to his workstation, he messes with the settings on his watch. It looks like he might be sneaking a picture of the code with a secret camera. Katie, who works very closely with Forrest and was present for Sergei's nematode presentation, also works in devs. She approaches Sergei, brings him water, and encourages him to settle in and take his time. Sergei asks her if the code is for real or only theoretical. She tells him that they've run the code and gotten real results. It's not theoretical. Whatever the code is, Sergey says that if it's true, it literally changes every single thing. Katie corrects him. No, if it's true, it changes absolutely nothing. In a way, that's the point. Unfortunately, Sergey gets caught taking secret photos. He tries to escape through the woods, but Forrest confronts him on the path. He forgives him because he says the universe is deterministic. Every cause has an effect, the world runs on tram lines, therefore Sergei could not have chosen to do anything but what he did. Still, an industrial spy must be eliminated, so Kenton tackles Sergei and puts a plastic bag over his head until he suffocates. Katie is there too. He's obviously missed by his girlfriend. She goes into work the next day and immediately approaches Kenton about her concerns. As head of security, he has access to all the CCTV on the campus, and they're able to track his movements as far as when he walked off campus toward the highway late last night. We know this footage must have been faked, but even though Lily doesn't, she still gets the sense that something is off. Forrest gets involved, acting concerned although he knows full well what happened to Sergey. He tells Kenton to call the police and report Sergey missing. Forrest gives her his personal guarantee that he is all over this. Lily does some digging of her own, checking out Sergei's phone from the last known backup. Nothing seems weird until she notices a Sudoku app. Not only did Sergei hate Sudoku, but it's also password protected and will erase all data after three incorrect tries. So that's weird and secretive. Lily seeks out her ex-boyfriend Jamie, who she left on bad terms, to ask his help hacking Sergei's phone. Unsurprisingly, he tells her to fuck off. To his credit, Forrest is upset by Sergei's death and his part in it. K 
Katie sits with him and they talk about how, knowing what they know, it shouldn't be so hard. But what are they supposed to do, unravel a lifetime of moral experience? Humans are hardwired magical thinkers. Take the most rational person in the world, and they'll still pray when their kid gets hurt. This is when it becomes obvious that Forrest's own daughter, likely the company namesake and mascot Amaya, was lost to him. The next morning, Lily is called in to watch CCTV footage of what appears to be Sergei sneaking back onto the Amaya campus, dousing himself in gasoline and setting himself on fire. That's clearly the end of Sergei and Lily is horrified and devastated. She runs to the amphitheater surrounding the Amaya statue and she sees his burnt corpse as Forrest and Kenton look on from their places, removed from the scene. A while later, Forrest has a heart-to-heart -heart with Lily, confiding in her that the moment he lost his daughter, Amaya, he split into two states, one in which her death was an impossible, absurd thing, and another in which it was all too true. He still holds both beliefs. He offers Lily anything she needs, day or night, plus financial and job security for as long as she needs it on devs. With nowhere else to turn, Lily tries again to get Jamie's help hacking into Sergei's phone. This time, she has an impossible thing to tell him, that Sergei burned himself to death. Jamie agrees to hack the phone. The Sudoku app is really a Russian state messaging app. Sergei must have been some kind of Russian spy, sent to infiltrate Amaya. The messages in the app are mostly requests for meetups and check-ins. Lily uses the app to request a meet and whoever is on the other end knows immediately that it's not Sergei. Is this Lily? They ask. She decides to be honest with them and they send her an address for a meetup and then delete the app and data remotely. Lily meets with Sergei's handler, a Russian guy named Anton. Sergei's job was to infiltrate devs and bring back the code. If Lily wants answers to Sergei's death, then she needs to work with Anton. He says if she wants to contact him again, move the chair away from her window and he'll get in touch. Jamie has a suspicion that Lily may try to use the messaging app and tries to convince her that would be a bad idea. A little late for that, but Lily tells him she agrees that it would be a bad idea. She doesn't tell him that she's already done it. Once he leaves, knowing that her home is under Russian surveillance, she leaves a sign in her window that simply says, fuck you. Kenton, who had a suspicion that Lily wasn't convinced of Sergei's extravagant suicide, followed her to her meeting with Anton. He later approaches Anton in a parking garage, as one professional to another, to ask him to leave Lily alone. Of course, Kenton doesn't really care about Lily. He's just using her as leverage. So, your strange private tech company can continue its strange private project totally unobserved, says Anton. That's obviously not going to happen. Anton stabs Kenton and they have a desperate struggle. Although Kenton is wounded, he wins the fight and breaks Anton's neck. Back at Devs, the research team is able to project the code back 2,000 years into the past and get a fuzzy representation of the crucifixion. So this code can somehow generate accurate visual proof of events in the past, but what else is it? But it's still just fuzzy and unreliable, so there's still work to do. Even so, Forrest takes a moment to himself and projects the code back to watch his daughter. In the next scene, a stern Katie outlines two strict rules. One, we don't look forward, we only look back. And two, we don't invade privacy. The latter seems to set Amaya apart from other tech companies, ethical enough to not use their powers to invade private citizens' lives. But the former implies that that power is terrifying. The fact that this conversation takes place is because Katie caught Stewart and Lyndon watching Marilyn Monroe have sex with Arthur Miller, which distracts from the machine's great and terrible potential. Instead, theirs is a specific, even cheeky conversation about a particular moment in time. Katie rolling her eyes at the machine as an excuse for homemade porn, and Stewart defending those two humans having sex, even if they are famous, is as unremarkable to the universe as breathing. It's unclear if Stuart would be similarly underwhelmed by the other images we glimpsed in the cold open. A cave person painting their handprint on a stone wall. The Emancipation Proclamation. Joan of Arc burning at the stake. Lily putting up the fuck you sign for Anton just the night before. The machine's projections into the past merely confirm that which we already know from historical records. Even though that early montage is both visually and orally blurry, there are enough universally recognizable signifiers, Jesus' crown of thorns, Abraham Lincoln's beard, Joan of Arc's haircut, to confirm these figures for viewers. Nothing that the devs team observes contradicts what humanity already knows of its history. 
If the devs team has access to the entirety of human history, wouldn't it seem more likely that they would look back in order to answer burning questions and solve cultural mysteries? The closest we get is Lyndon fact-checking the grassy knoll. Lee Harvey Oswald did indeed do it. The point, it would seem, is to provide clear enough confirmations of past events to prove that the machine is legitimate. Despite Katie's insistence, looking forward would seem to be the intention for future applications of the machine. And Stewart's scoffing implies that they at least believe Katie is already breaking her own rule. Speaking of, Forrest is purposefully vague with Lane, a visiting senator, when she demands to know what Amaya is working on with no government oversight. We're using our quantum system to develop a prediction algorithm, is his exasperating response, followed up by a similarly superior non-answer about whether it will rain tomorrow by saying, doesn't look like it. That makes it clear that he doesn't take anyone else's concerns seriously. While the senator rhetorically asks if the fate of America is trivial to Forrest, it's clear that that is exactly the case. Amaya has shoved all its tech competitors out of the market and is operating beyond government control, all to fulfill Forrest's singular plan. And so long as he continues to donate to Lane's campaign, she'll take those half-explanations and figure out how she might be able to benefit from Amaya's quantum futures. And that's where Lily comes in. Despite Forrest telling her to take as much bereavement leave as needed, she's back at Amaya quickly enough to make her supervisor, Anya and friend, Jen, worry about her well-being. Lily seems to confirm that anxiety when she confides in the two about conspiracy theories involving the government and larger forces possibly faking Sergei's death. When they escalate the situation to Kenton, Lily suddenly begins spiraling into a panic attack involving Fibonacci sequences and something that happened in Brooklyn. And next thing you know, she's on the ledge outside Kenton's office, staring down at Forrest and Lane on the ground. Kenton talks her down. As Forrest's muscle who nonetheless is smart enough to clean up after himself, Kenton seems to have been let in on some of the bigger picture. He knows there are tram lines to maintain. Interestingly, Forrest scolds Kenton about the Lily incident, saying, that was very close. It nearly fucked the universe. And Kenton is the one to remind him about tram lines, even if he doesn't know what it would mean for the universe to be fucked. While Kenton was distracted, Jen did her own bit of spy work and copied some data from his computer onto a flash drive. Because it turns out that she and Lily were on their own plan from Lily's first steps back onto Amaya's campus. Lily would act erratic, Jen would back it up with whispers about schizophrenic episodes, and together they would grab the security footage from the night of Sergei's supposed death. The two, driving back to San Francisco, burst out in relieved laughter, telegraphing to one another. Can you believe we actually got away with it? Despite Kenton's belief that they can weaponize Lily's supposed schizophrenic diagnosis against her, she doesn't seem worried. She got what she needed from Amaya and doesn't appear eager to return anytime soon. What she gains from that charade involves climbing back through poor Jamie's window and begging for his help. At least she has enough self-awareness to acknowledge it when he says, You want us to watch the man you left me for burn himself to death? That's transcendently weird, Lily. Weirder still is the discovery that the footage of Sergei setting himself on fire was doctored. Specifically, someone copy and pasted the same digital flames, which is easy enough to spot once Jamie keeps pausing and replaying the footage. Could the folks at Amaya be so arrogant as to think no one would notice their shoddy VFX? Was this a mistake from non-programmer Kenton, who otherwise seems so fastidious when he's actually dealing with flesh and blood targets? At any rate, Lily gets an answer. The body is real. The suicide is fake. Sergei is still dead, but he was murdered. And the scene ends on the shot of Kenton and other Amaya co-conspirators, dragging Sergei's corpse out to the courtyard and staging his self-immolation, except that it's rewound. The next scene begins with a tremor. The Amaya campus is shaken by an earthquake. Forrest kneels among the gold pillars outside to stabilize himself, while inside the electromagnetic elevator isn't exactly offering its smoothest rides. While emergency alarms sound, Lyndon and Stuart react accordingly. But Katie doesn't flinch. Stuart cracks his superior isn't scared because she knows it's not the big one, suggesting she's exploited their top-secret prediction algorithm tech to sneak a peek of the future. Speaking of breaking that all-important rule, Forrest does just that, post-quake. Standing before the big history-predicting screen, Amaya's boss is watching a fuzzy scene from the future. 
It shows a figure falling to the ground then trying to crawl away from something. While the scene's distorted by variances, the victim looks a lot like Lily. Our heroine seems safe and sound for now though, waking up in Jamie's apartment. Following their CCTV footage discovery, proving Sergei's suicide was staged by Kenton and his crew, she stayed the night. Jamie took the couch, she got his bed, complete with clean sheets. Given the evidence they now possess, Jamie urges Lily to call the police. She adamantly refuses, comparing Amaya to the Mafia. You really want to call the cops and inform on the mob? They'll kill me like they killed Sergei. Meanwhile, Katie joins Forrest's private viewing session. She tells him that if the technicians see him accessing the future, it makes it seem like the rule is open to being broken. Forrest is characteristically unfazed, saying, they know not to break the rule and they know we do break the rule. Katie counters, asking if her scruffy boss is concerned about the tram lines, referring to his favorite analogy of the future's set on rails path. But he reveals it's Amaya's ability to possibly alter that path that truly scares him. The future is fixed in exactly the same way as the past, she assures him. In 48 hours, Lily will die. That doomed fate doesn't seem far off, as Amaya's surly security chief arrives at Lily's apartment. He's there to pick her up for a doctor's appointment. Lily's resistant, claiming she's not ready for that step and would like to stay at home. Kenton doesn't care. He reminds her of the stroll she took on the ledge outside his office. He makes her an offer she can't refuse. See the doctor and we're done. She gets in the car. Back at Dev's, Lyndon has made a breakthrough. His quantum computing co-workers, as well as Forrest and Katie, have gathered to see what kind of wizardry he's pulled off this time. The gifted young engineer has managed to cut through the literal static of their backward predictions. He fires up an audio-only version of that 2,000-year-old projection of Christ's crucifixion. A crystal-clear voice, speaking Aramaic, fills the room. Everyone's jaw drops except Forrest's. Cute party trick. He snaps. He says Lyndon's leveraging of the multiverse to acquire the impressive result makes it moot. Forrest says he's undermined everything he's trying to do. Katie attempts to come to the kid's defense but is met with a shut up Katie from her increasingly unhinged boss. Lyndon claims Forrest is splitting hairs, and Forrest responds by firing him. He tells Lyndon to take his $10 million separation fee and never speak of his work to anyone, stating he will know. He also offers a threat of death to the rest of the team, reminding them what happened to Sergei, the Russian kid. Lily's appointment with Amaya's psychiatrist isn't going much better. He takes her history, asks some personal questions, and stresses doctor-patient confidentiality when she claims to have no memory of her breakdown in Kenton's office. After the session, Forrest's right-hand man has Lily wait outside while he goes in to see the doc about an invoice. The psychiatrist immediately breaks that doctor-patient confidentiality, giving Kenton all the dirty details on Lily, including the fact that she's not actually schizophrenic. When the two return to Kenton's car, he's none too happy about being played. He claims he knows everything, but spins it as though he's been informed Lily is actually a danger to herself, a high suicide risk. She panics when it becomes clear he's not driving her back to her apartment. She demands he stop the car. He doesn't comply. She grabs the wheels, crashes them into a highway divider. While a bleeding, limping Kenton stumbles out of the vehicle, Lily runs off unscathed. Meanwhile, Lyndon's not taking his termination so well. Upset he'll never set foot in Dev's or see Stuart. Again, he's not thinking like the genius he is. Fearing for his young friend's life, a level-headed Stuart strongly suggests he take his hefty severance package and run. Lyndon enjoys one last electromagnetic elevator ride to the exit, where two security guards are waiting to escort him out. In the backward projecting screening room, Katie's not happy with Forrest. She states he just fired her most talented engineer, but he doesn't care. Instead, he says that Lyndon introduced the multiverse into devs. He broke a rule that isn't open to being broken. She argues that he used beautiful mathematics, and he screams, shouting, it does not work. If it's not our Jesus, it's not my Amaya. With her emotionally fragile boss revealing his true motive, she responds, saying she broke a rule today too. Using Lyndon's new workaround, she dials in a crystal clear image of Forrest's daughter and leaves the room. As Forrest watches his little girl blow bubbles, he breaks down in tears. 
Following her desperate escape from Kenton, Lily heads back to Jamie's apartment. She's had a change of heart. She calls the police to report Sergei's murder. When the law shows up, they immediately place her under arrest for reckless endangerment. She's cuffed and read her rights. Amaya's sleazy psychiatrist also pops his head in to recommend an involuntary psychiatric hold. Lily seems genuinely upset and surprised, but given her previous performance in Kenton's office, we're inclined to think she has something up her sleeve. Jamie follows her into the hallway, trying to stop the police from taking her. He's pushed back inside his apartment by Kenton. Following another, more forceful push, Kenton draws the shades. Following Lily's forced psychiatric facility admission, the story continues with her medicated in a hospital bed. A beautiful bouquet sits on a table nearby. A card tucked among the flowers reads, Get well soon, Kenton. Her mind drifts to a vision of her apartment, where she, Sergei, and Jamie are living in harmony, and we see multiple versions of the trio going about their daily lives. Things aren't so harmonious at Jamie's apartment, where he's being tortured by Kenton. Amaya's increasingly scary security chief is holding his terrified victim's head beneath water. Drowning someone in a bathtub is apparently hard work, though, so Kenton sits down and takes a smoke break. Between puffs, he reveals he's ex-CIA and compares his methods to the Chinese government's handling of the Tiananmen Square protests. He then secures Jamie's silence by breaking one of his fingers and threatening to kill his family. Back at Dev's, Katie's watching this unsettling scene play out via the magic projection algorithm. Katie next fires up a flashback of a young Lily. She's playing a round of ancient Chinese board game Go with her dad. Her budding, above-average intelligence is recognized by her father, who's impressed by her ability to think several moves ahead. Next, we get a look at Lily and Sergei's first encounter at Amaya. Both nursing recent breakups, the two talk and flirt a bit. A connection is clearly made. Meanwhile, Jamie's not doing so well post-breakup, sadly viewing happy couple pics of Lily and Sergei on Facebook. Back at Lily's apartment, she and her new boyfriend are watching a movie before Sergei pauses it and they both confess their love for each other. Bored of stalking other people's pasts, Katie dials into her own college days. She's got a front row seat at a lecture on quantum particles. Several rows back, Forrest and an associate secretly watch as Katie calls out the professor's dualist bullshit, following a, are you fucking kidding? She calls her impressionable classmates dweebs, then bolts for the exit. Multiple versions of the frustrated Katie head outside. Forrest catches up with one and recruits her for a future position at Amaya. The next big screen flashback digs into Dev's true purpose, which is creepy. A dead rodent lies at the center of a sort of tech altar, surrounded by a mantle clock, animal skull, flower, feather, and a sugar cube. Forrest looks at the items, each sitting on a different point of the hexagonal surface, while Katie, Stewart, and Lyndon extrapolate inwards on computer terminals. Dev's central computer glows and hums. The selection of seemingly arbitrary items appears to be scanned into a computer by robotic tendrils. Whatever unholy experiment they're attempting works, Forrest encourages his team to keep going. We then see a tender moment between Forrest and his daughter. The Amaya founder comes off more doting dad than sociopath CEO as he reads his little girl a bedtime story. Fast forward to the next day, where Forrest sits on his porch. His wife calls, she's on her way home. As they discuss the evening's dinner plans, Forrest goes out to the street to meet her and Amaya. While they continue their trivial chat, her car nears their home before another speeding vehicle collides with it. Devastated, Forrest pulls the headphones from his ears while slowly walking toward the horrific wreckage. As he approaches the intersection where his wife's Honda was crushed, another version of his life plays in the foreground. The vehicle safely parks. Forrest removes Amaya from her car seat and his better half exits with a smile. Sadly, this isn't the version of the multiverse Forrest is living in. As he arrives at the overturned car, several, less deadly versions of the accident play out behind him. A tearful Katie watches this pivotal moment back at Dev's, then tunes into happier times, when they were attempting to reanimate a dead rat. Forrest and his second-in-command discuss the implications of their work. Katie posits that her boss is using Dev's to put himself on trail for Amaya's death. If their experiment works, Determinism precludes free will, and Forrest is absolved. If not, he's guilty, or, as he corrects, damned. 
They push forward with the test without the rest of the team. The mouse springs to life on the computer screen, despite still displaying full-on rigor mortis on the slab. Returning to the current universe, Jamie's undeterred by Kenton's threats. On the phone with his father, he arranges for his family to leave town for the foreseeable future. Kenton's making some critical moves as well. Back at Amaya, he's requested a sit-down with the boss and Katie. He threatens to bring them both down if they attempt to throw him under the bus. He also warns Lily is still a threat. On the Wayback Machine, Katie watches another of young Lily's formative moments. The future encryption engineer is at the hospital visiting her dad, who drops some ancient Greek wisdom on her. No man ever steps in the same river twice because it is not the same river and he is not the same man. Later at home, teenage Lily seems to ponder the proverb over the board game she beat her dad at earlier. This vision morphs into a more familiar one, Lily lying on her back, gasping her last breath. The next scene, however, shows Lily in slightly better shape, zonked at the hospital but still alive. And things are looking up. Jamie slips into her hospital room via an unlocked window. His hand is bandaged from his talk with Kenton, and Lily is groggy. Still, the two manage to sneak out of the facility unnoticed. The scene ends back at Dev's where Katie smirks while watching their escape unfold on the big screen. A few days later, we see Stuart heading home and finding Lyndon waiting in his camper. They talk about Forrest's machine, and it's here we learn the truth about what he plans to do. Forrest wants to revive his daughter and bring her back from the dead. Meanwhile, Lily wakes up in the motel where Jamie calms her down. They discuss what to do next, and he suggests going to the media. When she turns this idea down, they eventually settle on going straight to the root of the problem and visit Forrest's house. Katie happens to be there and she convinces Forrest and Jamie to head outside so she can talk alone with Lily. Outside, the duo get talking, and it turns out Forrest had no knowledge of Kenton torturing him and apologizes for what happened. The conversation soon turns to that of loss and trying to come to terms with it. Ironically, Forrest and Jamie have more in common than they first thought. At the same time, Lily and Katie talk about Sergei and what happened to him. Katie tells the truth and admits that Kenton killed him, but they covered it up. After dancing around information Lily already knew, she eventually asks just what Devs is. This prompts Katie to talk about reason and mention there are no random instances. After this home truth, Katie turns her attention to the future, where she admits that a fixed point in time, 21 hours from now, shows that the future is lost and this may be the point where cause and effect disappear. Lily hears enough and walks out the door. As she does, she spots Jamie playing frisbee with Forrest, but they drive away while Kenton watches this unfold from afar, sneering in disdain as he mutters, So you're all buddies now. Jamie and Lily head home together, with the latter calling Forrest and Katie insane. Meanwhile, Forrest in bed with Katie calls them brave for heading into the eye of the storm. The two reveal their feelings for each other. Arriving at her apartment, Lily invites Jamie to stay in her bed instead of sleeping on the couch. She admits that she didn't know Sergei and all that happened since he died was for nothing, for something that wasn't there. Lily says to Jamie, I know you, so stay in my bed. Then the two begin kissing as the scene ends. The scene continues with Lily and Jamie in bed together talking about mundane things, including the dishwasher and getting a cat. At the same time, Forrest and Katie begin their day, with the familiar multiple instances of Forrest and his daughter playing out again in the street. Back at Dev's, the group look upon their marvelous project and realize it's finally finished. Stuart speaks up on behalf of the team and talks about this box with infinite possibilities. One of those possibilities happens to be the machine predicting the future, which the group sees as the algorithm predicts their every move a split second before it actually plays out. Jamie and Lily discuss the predictions surrounding her going to Dev's, and in order to defy that, she decides to hang out in the apartment with Jamie. At the same time, Lyndon and Katie discuss the project and what happens next for him. As Katie talks about Lyndon balancing on the edge of the railings, he does just that after they discuss the predetermined nature of this reality. As we soon see, Lyndon was always meant to fall off the edge of the dam and land in a crumpled heap on the ground. Back at Dev's, Stuart confronts Forrest and questions him about the project. He tells the creator that he made the system work on the same design principles Lyndon thought of, 
rather than using Forrest's version. While Forrest stews in this revelation, Kenton arrives at Lily's apartment and shoots Jamie in cold blood. Lily tries to outsmart him, but it's too much. He chokes her out until the homeless man from outside arrives and saves the day, killing Kenton. In the aftermath of this, he tells Lily to go and sit on the couch and admits he had orders to watch and protect Sergei. When that failed, he made it his mission to protect Lily. Unfortunately, his choice to kill Kenton has now put them on a different path or tram line, if you will, and changed their fortune. Back at Dev's, Forrest and Katie sit together and watch cavemen carving paintings on the wall. He questions how nothing could change for so long, with the current trend of the world changing every few months or so, thanks in part to the digitalized nature of our reality. Discussing what comes next for Lily, they talk about the predetermined events of the night and wait for Lily to make her move. After making some final changes to the apartment, Lily heads off to Dev's just like she was always supposed to. At the entrance, she runs into Stuart who questions just who she is and tells her to turn around and leave as that place is not good for her. Unfortunately, Lily has come too far and she can't turn around now. Instead, Stuart helps her into the elevator as she prepares for the final conflict ahead. Picking up where we left off from before, the finale begins with Lily awaiting her fate in Dev's. As Stuart whispers, we see flashes of Forrest and his daughter as the end nears. Lily approaches the infamous door that leads to the projection screen we've seen so much of and inside, sits Forrest waiting for her. He invites her to sit with him where she tells him she doesn't know who she is anymore. He apologizes to Lily, but reminds her life is just something we watch unfold. Forrest goes on to talk about the machine and determinism as a whole, showing her the screen of his daughter. Lily tells him she's just a computer simulation, and the two verbally spar over just what this actually means, including Forrest believing he's a messiah. He scoffs at the notion of Lily undermining him and goes on to predetermine everything Lily's about to do, including taking a gun out of her pocket. She doesn't use it just yet though, so Forrest uses the machine to show her the final moments where the simulation breaks down, including a static shot of Katie waiting outside the room and Lily holding him up at gunpoint. Lily eventually shoots him inside the lift, and as he collapses to the ground, the vacuum seal breaks, and with it, the elevator tips and crashes to the ground. This links up with the images we've seen of Lily crawling across the floor in previous scenes. As they leave the room for real this time, Lily holds Forrest up at gunpoint and leads him to the elevator just like in the previous vision, only she instead throws the gun aside and doesn't follow through with the prediction, calling him a false prophet. Unfortunately, the lift still falls and kills them both as Stuart decides to send the elevator crashing down by hitting the emergency button. Katie watches this unfold in horror and asks Stuart why he did what he did. Don't blame me, Katie. It was predetermined, he says before walking away. As he does, Katie talks to Forrest in the visualization chamber, where it turns out he's been transported into the system as a simulation. Given Lily made her own choice, it's completely changed what's happened, and Forrest laughs at the notion as he realizes Lily is the original sin. The original sin of disobedience and defying her messiah, which is interpreted as Forrest. As he dematerializes from view, Katie wishes him luck as he heads off to see his daughter. The familiar distorted horn noise picks up again as we cut across to Lily. She finds herself back in her apartment with Sergei still alive. Time appears to have been rewound to the moments before Sergei heads to Amaya for his job interview and subsequently spying. Now knowing what's going on, Lily looks at the world with new clarity and vigor, heading up to Dev's where she finds Forrest alive and with his wife and daughter too. Forrest and Lily then talk about this alternate timeline that sees them inside the system, having now been resurrected and reinserted into this simulation. Only, they're the only two who realize this as everyone else is just going about their lives like normal. Forrest tells her this is a worthy cross to bear in order to live out their best world together, as they let the simulation play out. After a brief segment involving Katie talking about the simulation to Senator Lane, Lily makes her choice and finds Jamie, hugging him tightly where the show ends.